Begin Podfix Network transmission. In three, two, one. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, a show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. So it's always interesting, usually funny, and mostly true. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, your best friend. Thank you so much for tuning in this week to the Fish Nerds. Happy May to you. Hope you had a good May so far. I know I did. I got some, some fishing in this week, which is a great change for me. <laughs> Been a long time since I caught a fish. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to talk about a brand new sponsor. This is a big deal sponsor, so we're excited about this. Boat Center, by the way, is the name of the sponsor. We'll talk about them in a little bit. And even bigger deal than that, and it's a big deal, uh, Dr. Martin, Doc Martin, our chief science correspondent, is back with us, and she interviewed Dr. Barbarossa about how climate change affects freshwater fish. So if you're excited about science, this is the show for you. It's going to get super deep, super nerdy, and we are so excited about this. Also, Andrew Lewin from Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast is with us doing our bi-weekly Fish in the News. He'll be coming on as a regular, doing some news with us. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot to talk about tonight, but let's get right into it. I want to talk about my fishing that we've done this week. Uh, really cool. We had opening day for trout season. A few days ago, trout being um, trout ponds here in New Hampshire, they open up in the last week of April. And my daughter Zoe and I decided to head on out. The plan was to forage wild ramps. Ramps are like a, a wild leek and fiddleheads, which is a ostrich fern, and then cook them with a with a brook trout that we caught on opening day. And so I'll tell you how it went. So first of all, we went out into the floodplains of the Saco River. And we found fiddleheads, no problem. There's tons of them, and they're great. And what fiddleheads are, if you don't know, is they're the beginnings of a fern. They look like the head of a fiddle. And ostrich ferns, are they're, they've got this kind of brown, it's like newspaper or paper wrapping on them. That's how you can tell them apart. And they're delicious. So we picked a bunch of those. And then we went to another river, the Wildcat River, where I know there's a bunch of ramps. And ramps are the, this wild leak and they're not sustainable here in new hampshire there's not a lot of them so we just pick the leaves we don't we don't pick the uh the bulbs and that way they grow back we just take one leaf from each plant so that we got we got our bulb we got our we got our our our, our uh, leeks we got our fiddleheads next job go find go find some trout so we go down to our favorite trout pond which is down the street from our house and john king the crappie hippie has sent zoe some lead free uh jigs he tied up from glass water angling so we took those, put them on a hook, and we just dug around the leaf litter, and we added a little piece of worm to them to sweeten up. These uh, hatchery fish love worms, and we knew this. We hiked down to the pond, cast out, and you can we, we could not quite cast to where the brook trout were. You can see them in the water. They're splashing around. Other anglers are catching them like crazy. So to catch them, we had to wade into 49-degree water uh, and cast where the other anglers were catching them, and we did. We managed to, Zoe and I each caught two brook trout. We kept one apiece. And uh, there was a lot of fun, and we brought them home, and here's how we cooked them. This is your fish recipe this week. We decided we were going to grill the brook trout. So we gutted them, let them whole, and we, we make our own maple syrup. So we took some maple syrup we made, we added salt to it, we added garlic and pepper to it, uh, and mixed it all up together, like a nice little briny, sweet, delicious. Threw the fish on the grill, brushed that brine I don't brine that sauce onto the fish. And while that was cooking, we got a pan, good and hot, put some butter in it. We blanched the fiddleheads ahead of time, just a minute in the water just to blanch them to kill the salmonella. Yeah, yeah that's a thing. Uh, and we threw them in hot butter on the pan. We took some the, the uh, ramp leaves and piled them on the grill just to get them a little bit wilty while the fish was cooking. When we turned the fish over, we put a pot of water on the on the stove, and we poached an egg. And while that was poaching, Zoe made some hollandaise sauce. She made it from scratch, too, which is really great. And all, all it is really is a stick of butter and some lemon. <laughs> Not much more to a little salt, maybe, um, and some egg. And we had a lot of fun with that. And it, it, it didn't work out. The hollandaise sauce did not come out perfectly, but that's okay because bad hollandaise sauce still tastes like a stick of melted butter, which is delicious. So we cooked the fish till it was done, brushed it with plenty of that sauce, 
and we put the the, the ramps on the plate, the, the fish on top of the ramps, the fiddleheads, we had a little salt and pepper garlic to those as well, on top of the fish, and then a poached egg on top of the fiddleheads, and then the hollandaise sauce on top of everything. And holy smokes, you've never had fish this good. If you haven't had fish <laughs> with hollandaise sauce and a poached egg on it, some ramps and fiddleheads, you are missing out. This was the best trout I've ever eaten. And I bet you if the hollandaise sauce was made right, this would be a restaurant quality dish. Man, that was so, so good. Highly recommend if you're going to cook brook trout, give that a shot and report back. You can you can thank me later. We ate everything. Fins, all that was left was just, we ate fins, skin, everything. All we left was just, just bones. Um, really, really good, rich, delicious dish. So, oh man, so good. So good. That's how we did it. And we're sticking to it. And again, thanks to John King, the crappie hippie, for the glass water angling jigs. It made a big difference. All right. So let's talk about a sponsor. I think we need some music for this one. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is big news here. Boat Setter, that's our new sponsor. They are the go-to platform for all types of boating experiences, including fishing. You can book your charters or guides, including the Fish Nerds Guide Services, my business, or you can rent boats for going out on your own, which is really cool. All types of boats and charters are available, from bass boats and pontoons, center consoles, and offshore sport, offshore sport fishers. Visit BoatSetter.com or download the Boat Setter app to plan your next adventure and get 5% off when you book with the code FISHNERDS. And what this really is, is let's say you're on vacation and you know there's water nearby and you want to get on the water. If you go to BoatSetter.com, you can book a boat. And it's individual owners just letting you use their boat. And the nice thing about Boat Setter, too, is they've partnered with, I think it's Geico, and they can help you, uh, they can help get the boat in the water in an insured, nice way. And if you've got a boat and you want to make some money on your boat, they can help you with that as well because you can be part of their Boat Setter group and get your boat for rent. That's how the Fish Nerds book a lot of our trips. They used to be part of Fisher Guiding, and we booked a ton of ice fishing trips through them a couple of years ago. And so we're really excited about this partnership. So anywhere you are in the country, BoatSetter.com for your boating needs. And you can rent a boat and go out and fish and play and do what you, all the things you want to do. We'll talk about more, talk about them more later, I'm sure. And I highly recommend you try them again. Use the code FISHNERDS to save 5% off when you book your next adventure with BoatSetter.com. And we're super excited. This is a real deal sponsorship, and we really do appreciate them. If you support the Fish Nerds, please support our sponsors. Now, now it's time to get into it with Doc Martin. Doc Martin was on an interview with Dr. Barbarossa on how climate change affects fish, freshwater fish specifically. And we're going to let Dr. Barbarossa and Doc Martin take it away from here. Hey, everybody. It's Doc Martin. Um, I'm really excited to bring a guest speaker here today for you guys to listen to. Uh, Valerio is going to talk about some of his recent published work on how climate change affects freshwater fish species. And so, um, Valeria, why don't you say hi to everybody? Hi, hi everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. And so, uh, what is your current position and how did you get to where you are? Uh, so, I'm, I'm currently based at uh, Adelaide, Adelaide University. It's, uh, it's located in the Netherlands, you know, it's this tiny country in uh, Northern Europe. And um, I'm an assistant professor there at the CML, it's the Institute of Environmental Sciences. And uh, near besides teaching, I focus on, um, on impact assessments related to human activities in freshwater ecosystems. And, um, and often, you know, I look at uh, these kind of issues uh, affecting our favorite ecosystems from a uh, from large scale global perspective. I'm also, I also work at the, what's called PBL, which is the Dutch Environmental Assessment Agency. And um, uh, yeah, here I, I kind of uh, take part to this uh, integrated assessment models. That's what they're called. These uh, this kind of models that we use uh, at a global scale to forecast uh, what's going to happen in the future. For instance, in uh, in one of those uh, in those UN uh, United Nations assessments like the IPCC, the IPBAS, they're used in these kind of uh, assessments. And I work on the on the Globio group, which is a biodiversity assessment model in developing uh, aquatic modules, actually. Very cool. Uh, and so um, you do a lot of mathematical stuff then. And yeah. so are you more of a modeling and mathematician that just happened to work with fishes? <laughs> well, yeah, it's so, uh, yeah. I, I mean, 
um, it, it, it kind of went like that. I mean, um, so I, I do I do not really have uh, you know how, how did I get where I am? It's uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of a uh, circumstances, I guess. But uh, yeah, so I don't have one of those uh, you know uh, super cool answers where you know everything starts from life changing events for like you know this what what you hear often actually a little bit too often sometimes uh, where people having these sorts of moments where you know uh, I don't know I was in. Uh, uh, for instance, I was in fourth grade. I was carrying this ball with a with a with a goldfish. The ball dropped and the fish died, and that's where I knew I was going to study fish for the rest of my life. It's, it's, not, it's not exactly I I went. I mean, the, the, there might be some unconscious bias that drove me from the you know from more the the, the modeling uh, community to more towards the ecological community. But after all, I guess my I was always doing. I was kind of always a curious person, always uh, like science. And uh, but yeah, I also approached it maybe from a modeling perspective, uh, mostly. Uh, but I guess what what steered me towards the study of uh, more uh, fish, uh, fish species and biodiversity assessments was happened during my PhD. Uh, was there you, you know during your PhD you you kind of you. you, you you're often steered by your supervisors in uh, in different directions. You know, if you, if you did a PhD, you know, you know what I'm talking about, and one pulls you one direction, the other one another direction. And there was a supervisor of mine. She 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 kept sending every Christmas a picture of a of a fish dressed up in uh, with Christmas clothes, and I guess that that eventually did it. And uh, you know, I ended up. Uh, uh, you know, the, kind of steering my, my expertise from mathematical modeling. Uh, mostly, I was coming from geoscience more uh, and hydrology, and this kind of modeling more towards the ecology part of things. And uh, you know, I, that's I guess that's how I ended up uh, doing this uh, ecological global studies. So, what I should do as a fish professor is I need to send more fish in Christmas clothes to people to recruit them to my side. Absolutely, yeah. Them? <laughs> well, that worked for me. <laughs> hey, I kind of like that. Um, and so let's talk about your paper. So it was published um, in Nature Communications. And just yeah. for the listeners listening, the title um, was Threats of Global Warming to the World's Freshwater Fishes. And so um, what types of observations and questions led you to this particular project? Um, so, um, so mostly, you know, during, well, this is a project that actually started quite, quite some time ago. It started during my PhD. There was, I started my PhD back in, in 2015. So we're talking about, uh, some, some time ago and, and, you know, and when I was reviewing papers, mostly, uh, I saw in the last decade, there were, uh, lots of, um, uh, lots of assessments coming out about uh, impacts of climate change. I had an interest in climate change, of course, and uh, but they were mostly about uh, terrestrial species and for freshwater species were, were kind of, uh, uh, well, especially in these global assessments I'm talking about, and freshwater species were kind of, uh, you know, underrepresented. Uh, even if you look at those global assessments like IPBAS or IPCC, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so I guess, um, and you know, I guess my driving, uh, and, and even if you look at, uh, what is it? The, the Living Planet Index that was uh, being published around that time as well. Um, well, there's been an update after that. And the Living Planet Index is this uh, this kind of assessment by the International Union. Well, the IUCN is the National you know, for Conservation of Nature or something like that, I think. I, I think um, that's yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was trying to come up with acronyms sometimes, you know, we use lots of acronyms. Um, and uh, yeah, and basically it's where they monitor these, uh, uh, these uh, multi-species populations. So they monitor these populations through time uh, and see which ones are declining faster than others sometimes. And the, then you could see that actually freshwater species were declining at the, at the faster pace, faster faster pace in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, and, and, you know, that's all combined with actually, actually where I also was at during my PhD, a little bit of what I was talking before, that, that brought me to the point that like, well, we, we need to do this study. So we, we kind of we kind of teamed up with the, with the uh, with, um, with, with some guys from uh, from Utrecht University that, that developed this global hydrological model that could predict water temperature, and then uh, we kind of and we kind of did that. And you know, at the time of the study, uh, I was there. Um, uh, it was I think around 2017 or 2018. 
or something like that when we had started. And then I was seeing actually, I started paying more attention and actually seeing in the news that were coming up lots of news of uh, mass fish kills because of uh, very hot um, summer water temperatures and uh, of course droughts and all the other things. And, you know, I just made it all fall into place uh, nicely together. And uh, I guess that's when we started to really go for it. And so do you think, so fish kills are a little bit seasonal. And I think our listeners probably have seen that, right? As summer comes up, there's a algal blooms, water gets hot, and it's this very cyclical thing. So when you're talking about these fish kills, are you saying that they are more prevalent or they are more severe or a combination of both happening? Or uh, what was it about this cyclical nature that made you go, hey, there's something else that's different here? Well, I guess... Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. So basically, what I uh, what I saw here is it's more of a, a potential imprint of uh, what uh, climate change could look like because we know that from uh, from climatological studies, what we know is that the climate change will really exacerbate these extreme uh, events. And of course, uh, fish kills are uh, are uh, seasonal, but this might might become so um, so frequent that might have implications for uh, you know local extirpations or local extinctions, which uh, we might be uh, kind of uh, uh, overseeing at the moment because we we just uh, don't have enough studies uh, trying to forecast this kind of these kind of events uh, translate these kind of climatological events in uh, potential biodiversity impact. So I guess that's really that, that was my angle in. Uh, uh, I, I, at, at the time, I wasn't, you know, uh, an, as expert as I am now. So maybe I didn't look at all the details of those uh, uh, mass fish scales. For me, it was like more on the surface, maybe. It, but we maybe what's uh, what's important for our studies that we mostly uh, look at um, uh, species specific. Uh, uh, you know, geographic ranges, we, we looked at the distribution of species mostly, and then we aggregated it mostly as uh, richness rather than uh, other diversity metrics. And not just yeah. a couple species, like 11,000-ish, right? Different yes. fish species, yes. that's yes. a lot. So how do you get that much information over some fishes that I would say maybe we don't know a lot about sometimes? Um, yeah, uh, good point. Uh, that's uh, That was actually one of the you know, was well, one of the challenges actually in, uh, uh, in putting together the study because of course we wanted to, to try to be as comprehensive as possible. And, uh, and indeed, as you're mentioning, there's, there's lots of species that we, we don't know much about. We just know, uh, for instance, information from, uh, uh, from some experts uh, mentioning where, um, where, where the species uh, occur. And uh, we, we, we kind of know their distribution, but we, we don't really know um, you know, much other information about them. That's why in the study, what we, what we tried to do it was to collect from uh, openly accessible data sets as much of this type of information about the distribution of each single species as possible. And, uh, and what we did is just assessing um, kind of uh, whether, you know, a species was living in lakes, was living in rivers, or was uh, also migrating to the marine environment. And based on the, for freshwater uh, fish, of course, we're talking about. And, and based on this kind of information that you, uh, you know, there's this uh, big uh, uh, platform called uh, Fish Base, where they, they kind of try to, uh, you, you're probably aware of that if you if you work in the field, where they, where they try to, you know, uh, they make this uh, big effort in harmonizing nomenclature and, and kind of providing as much information as possible. And then based on that, uh, what, what, I, what I did is was basically combining all these different data sets. For instance, we use this also, the citizen science, citizen science, sorry, that's a hard word to pronounce for me. Uh, <laughs> a data set like GPF and uh, to, to collect uh, data, uh, point of current data, so uh, specific locations where fish occur. And, uh, and then, you know, combining all this metadata together uh, to kind of get uh, this data set with very basic information. Um, but, but we also tried, you know, to compile some traits uh, for species, uh, but it's it's a little bit like you're saying. So, for instance, for something like traffic categories, we we don't really have uh, lots of information for. I think there there's just about half of the species that are a bit that are data deficient. Or, for instance, for the threat category from from the from IUCN, we also there don't have a full. Um, understanding of, um, I think there's also there 30, 40% of species that are data deficient uh, that are in our data set. But for instance, something like um, body size, that was actually pretty well covered. And there we could actually look 
uh, at how you know a species with different uh, body sizes might have uh, might have been affected differently, and um, and so on. Yeah. So that's one component of this giant data set you put together is what uh, fish species have enough data that you can include. And then yes. you compared it to um, climate models and their effect on some hydrologic variables like temperature and flow. And yeah. so um, where did you get those data from? So th that's your two big data camps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, and being a modeler, that's uh, <laughs> this kind of, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what I put lots of effort anyway into uh, for this study. Um, so basically what we did uh, is that we, we used this uh, global hydrological model and then we run it ourselves, actually. We had to use uh, one of these uh, super fancy uh, cluster environments, supercomputers, let's call them supercomputers, or, mm -hmm. um, um, so, so data centers. And uh, the, the, we used the, the one that's called Cartesius, it's the national, actually, supercomputer of the Netherlands. And there you can run, you know, this uh, global hydrological model, which is, uh, which takes data from, uh, uh, in terms, global climate models. I'm, not, I'm, I'm giving lots of uh, jargon here, but, <laughs> but but what is it? It's basically, you know, if you if you can imagine the hydrological cycle, is that you get um, um, air temperature, precipitation, uh, radiative forcing, and other variables that are important for this uh, to, to to kind of model the hydrological cycle, and then this uh, process based models uh, they kind of do the trick. Let's put it that way. Uh, at, uh, uh, of course, with um, by, by modeling all the interactions between the different water compartments and uh, and producing these maps uh, that you can then use for your um, uh, for your ecological niche modeling that we use in this case here. And so you really compared, um, I think, three different models, right? One where uh, the kind of the lowest temperature, assuming everything stopped. Um, and warming was slowed to the maximum, an in-between one, and then an extreme. Is that right? Um, well, more or less. Uh, more we less. actually, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, we looked at different uh, um, uh, different scenarios. So you're the, um, I think, uh, maybe it's not as relevant for the for the fish nerd audience, but just for sake of clarity, uh, you know that you whenever you you talk about uh, climate data, you need to for future you need to consider that you always need to look at the at the wide range of ensemble what we call ensemble models because every model kind of has its own assumption and gives different outputs. On top of that. Then, as you're saying, we look at four different scenarios uh, for emissions. So the scenarios of emissions are what are called uh, representative concentration pathways. And basically, based on the radiative force and other variables, they give you kind of, uh, yeah, so business as usual scenarios or um, or more uh, or scenarios where we are supposed to curb emissions and, uh, and lower uh, the expected global warming in the future. Yeah, and so uh, what did you find? What's the brief overview of your very technical paper? <laughs> yeah, so um, so basically, what we uh, what we found is that uh, what we what we did is that we compared um, uh, what was happening at different global warming levels in the future. So we we kind of tried to aggregate and summarize our results that were coming from an ensemble of twenty different uh, model outputs in uh, into something that indeed we could um, create a narrative for. And and basically, what we what we found is that at 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 uh, if we if we look at the well, let's not take the most extreme scenario already. If we look at the, at the global warming of uh, 3.2 degrees by the end of the century, which is basically a scenario that assumed that after the, um, the put it in simple words, the, uh, the current commitments of, uh, of nations for uh, to curb global emissions, uh, there's, there's no further action after 2030 or something. Uh, I think, yes, it should be after 2030. So that's kind of a, a scenario where there's going to be a global warming that's uh, it's a, it's a bit uh, against what scientists are um, suggesting to, uh, to, to do. Um, so in that global warming, we have um, that the percentage of species losing more than half of their habitat is uh, it's about 30%, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I can... Uh, in double check, yeah, in front of the laptop anyway. 
Uh, so to give you just exact number, yeah, it's uh, it's about thirty six percent. That's what we found, more or less. Uh, well, if you, you you know if you if you manage to keep global warming within uh, two degrees uh, Celsius, so meaning that compared to uh, eighteen fifty, by the way, when I talk about global warming, it's the compared to eighteen fifty. Um, the, the increase in global mean air temperature is going to be two degrees. Uh, so if we if we manage to, to to get to two degrees, the percentage will decrease uh, to to nine percent. Of species losing more than half of their range. This means that it's a decrease uh, of about eighty um, uh, percent, right? Uh, and and this can be further halved. So we can really half the impacts on uh, on, on freshwater uh, fish by keeping global warming within the one and a half degree, which is actually what uh, sciences are, uh, climate sciences are uh, suggesting now to um, and to do because it's not only about freshwater fish, of course, it's uh, uh, it's an integrated problem of uh, of impacts, and and there we can reduce the percentage of species uh, of fish, river and fish, losing mm, uh, well having more than a half of their range threatened. Now I'm saying losing, but it's actually, we're, we're talking about threats here. Uh, so we can reduce the percentage to, to about about 4%. And so that's reducing it to 4% lost at the minimum warming. Yes, that's yes. at the minimum warming. So we, we, we anyhow, based on our uh, ecological niche modeling of uh, climate extremes, we still see some... Uh, um, uh, some impacts also at one and a half degree. And so I think what might surprise some people is that when you talk about one or two degrees, that doesn't feel like a lot of degrees, um, <laughs> but it clearly has a really big impact. And why do you think that is? Well, uh, that's a, a good question. question yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's uh, that's more of a question for climate scientists, but I, I can give it a, a try from from our perspective at least. Uh, what does it mean is that when when you look at the you know an average uh, increase. Uh, doesn't really give you that. That's just a, a way that we use to, to to kind of quantify how much global warming is. But it, it actually uh, it actually doesn't say much about uh, you know the impacts that that might have uh, because um, uh, for instance, um, so, so the problem with, with climate change is really um, uh, amplification of extremes of extreme weather events. So. Uh, and, uh, increasing the, the the heat or the radiative well let, let, let's keep the the, the, the jargon easy so the, in, increasing the, the 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 amount of heat that the, the earth will will uh, will retain right instead of uh, um, repelling it back in space uh, basically um, um, we will have consequences which are different in different parts of the world, right? So there, there might be, for instance, uh, um, areas that are already prone to drought, uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, fresh water that will even be drier in the future. So we're, we'll, we'll, we'll go towards uh, maybe more water scarcity issues or something that we, um, that we that we were forecasting, actually, some models and, and places um, that our wet might become also wetter. So, for instance, problems with flooding and all these kind of things. So, um, the, the the air temperature is just something to to make us understand. Uh, you know that there, there's actually some levels to to, to to climate change, but really uh, it's a, it's a combined effect of impacts which are very differential in different parts of the world. And so, you actually looked a little bit about differential impacts of temperature and flow. And so yeah. um, I was a little surprised in your paper. I'm not exactly sure how you stated it, but that temperature seemed to be more important than changes in flow. Although those two things are related, right? If you have changes in, in temperature patterns and climate patterns, you will have changes in flow. And so uh, can you talk about just the magnitude of temperature change versus those flow changes in your model? Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just shut this door a little bit more yeah, in case there's some background noise. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. There's uh, some neighbors doing some uh, some constructions in the garden. Uh, anyway, uh, the, um, uh, what we found basically is that we were actually um, a bit surprised by, in fact, indeed the fact that uh, water temperature was uh, more important than flow of quite a bit. 
And uh, but what we actually uh, saw when we really tried to overlay the patterns of where species would be threatened by water temperature compared to where uh, species would be threatened by alterations in flow is that actually they were a bit complementary. They weren't actually uh, necessarily correlated in terms of. Uh, so, for instance, the, um, if a species was uh, being threatened by temperature in a certain area, it wasn't necessarily also. Uh, that certain area that would have been threatened because of uh, changes in flow. So basically, that's what we uh, that's what we found. So we found they were more complementary rather than um, uh, correlated. A, a little bit against our expectations because we would also expect, you know, if the river gets drier and the temperature, the air temperature increases, then also the uh, the water temperature uh, might increase. Um, so yeah, that, that's a little bit what we found. And in terms of magnitude, yeah, there there's a little bit of, uh, I guess, um, uh, there's also some uh, some things that we can explain from a modeling perspective. Uh, for instance, the fact that the, that the water temperature explained most of the uh, percentage of uh, the ranges that were threatened uh, due to climate change. It might also be due to the fact that, you know, the uh, the water temperature is much less variable than uh, than flow within uh, a certain species range, and um, and because of that, uh, species might be closer in, in uh, so, so the ecological niche of, uh, of what maybe I'm, I'm getting into to complicated territory. But basically, what it means is that the um, um, uh, the, the the species might have a kind of uh, more homogeneous. Uh, extreme water temperature throughout uh, the range. And therefore, if, um, and, and because water temperature is forecasted to, to increase almost everywhere. So that's, I think that's probably an important part that it's worth mentioning because water temperature is kind of forecasted to increase, to increase almost everywhere. Uh, what we see is that the larger portion of the fish range might be affected. Well, you know, for, for flow, since we're talking about extreme flows, but we're not looking, of course, at the entire set of metrics that might affect uh, freshwater fish, because we're talking about extreme flows. And for instance, if we uh, think about the low flows and, uh, and, um, and dry periods uh, within, uh, within streams, there, for instance, uh, the, the, re the spatial resolution, what you call spatial resolution of our model, which is basically uh, what kind of level of detail uh, we can map uh, with our hydrological model, doesn't allow us necessarily to, uh, you know, see what happens in the headwaters or in the upper stream reaches where, for instance, depleted low flows um, might be very important uh, for fish. So there we might be underestimating actually uh, the, the impact of uh, altered flows on, on fish. Yeah, particularly in those headwaters. Yeah, where it... yeah I think so, yeah. Yeah, so this is maybe a, a best case scenario. <laughs> Would you say uh, that? The, uh, the, I, I can't make this kind of statement, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, yeah, it, it feels a little bit for flow, especially. Uh, it might be that it's, you know, um, um, for flow is, is, is kind of a best case scenario. If we look at not only at flow extremes, there might be other things that were difficult to capture in our model um, uh, for uh, you know alter flows and, and their effect on, um, on the, yeah on 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 parts on areas of the fish range that might be threatened. Yeah, and I believe you did have that in your paper. Some some healthy doses of hey, this is a really cool model and important, but we couldn't capture everything because. Yeah, no, absolutely. All models are wrong, but some are useful, right? So hopefully this one's a useful one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, the, qu the quote from Cox, right? Yeah. A boxer. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, um, yeah, yeah, that's also the beginning of actually of my doctoral thesis. So uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that resonates well with uh, any, any model, uh, I believe. It depends uh, uh, on the domain of application of your model and, uh, you know, um, uh, caveats. It's, uh, I mean, when, when we do science, I think caveats is the first thing that you need to think of when when you when you discuss results. So, and so for this this very complicated model that you use to see some really cool patterns that um, you can use to maybe predict some of the species losses, assuming minimum to maximum um, climate effects. So what? 
what do non-scientists need to know? So if you're talking to non-scientists, what is the big takeaway of this paper that you want people to understand? Yeah. Um, so I think that the, the main uh, takeaway of my study is that uh, climate change, uh, especially well, if we're talking about global warming, actually, uh, especially if not cut below uh, one and a half degree, um, uh, might have quite important impacts for our <laughs> beloved freshwater fish. And, uh, you know, limiting global warming to, to one and a half degree rather than two degrees, as we show in this paper, might already have the, the, the expected impacts of climate ex extremes on river and fish. And, uh, and if we don't manage even to keep the two degree threshold, um, uh, basically uh, what, what we see is that uh, climate extremes might increase uh, the impacts on freshwater fish as much as 80% compared to a two, de two degree uh, warmer world. So, so, so basically what I'm saying here is that if you want your children to be able to listen um, uh, to, to people like us talking about fish in the Fishner podcast uh, rather than paleontologists, talking about fish, species of the near past, then I, then I think that we should also start trying to, uh, you know, adapt our, our lifestyles um, to more climate-friendly ones and vote for the right politicians that can actually help uh, with policies that might help curb emissions, you know, and, uh, and of course, also cross all the fingers we have. <laughs> awesome. And so if uh, our listeners wanted to read your work or find out more about what you do, is there somewhere that they could go on the internet to find you? Um, yeah, I'm sure. I, I don't have a fancy website, but uh, you can reach me on uh, you can reach me on uh, LinkedIn as uh, Valerio Barbarossa, and uh, and on Twitter I'm also on Twitter as uh, v uh, underscore uh, Barbarossa. All right, great. We'll share uh, those uh, links with our fans when we post the podcast for them, so they can come and find you and ask you about the freshwater fishes and climate change. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Valerio. Well, hopefully we'll see you again soon with your next big research project. <laughs> of course. So uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, Erika. And uh, see you next time. See ya. Very nice. Thank you, Docs. I'm two Docs in one. <laughs> and we really do appreciate that. The reason this show is so nerdy is because we got Doc Martin hanging out with him. We, we really do appreciate Doc Martin. So now it is time to get into the news. We're going to get into it deep today with Andrew Lewin from Speak Up from the Ocean Blue podcast. But before I do that, I do want to mention, I do want to mention BoatSetter.com one more time because it's really important to me that you know who our sponsor is. Uh, so I'm going to read the ad they sent me. I'm going to play that music again. I like that music. Oh, yes. So if you own a boat, do you want to go out on a boat? Do you own a boat yourself? Boat Setter is the go-to platform for all types of boating experiences, including fishing. It's also a way for charters to grow their business or for boat owners to rent out their boats to make money. It's a really good deal here. If you sign up to list your boat for rent for charters, tell Boat Setter that Fish Nerds sent you. The team will send you a free swag package when your boat listing is complete. Visit BoatSetter.com or download the Boat Setter app to plan your next adventure and get 5% off when you book with Fish Nerds. So, you want to set, you want to rent your, your boat can make you money when you're not using it. This is perfect, and again, they're insured with Geico. They'll help you out a lot. So really cool stuff there. Boatsetter.com. We appreciate the sponsorship. Now let's get into it with some fish in the news. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the Hey, Clay. Welcome back to Ocean Talk Friday. You ready to get into this? I'm ready. Hi, Andrew. How's it going? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. Let's uh, let's get into these stories because I am so excited. Yeah. First My, I'll of tell all, you, I'm going to stop you. you for a second. My favorite part okay. of this, we, this is our second time in, in two weeks doing this. And I always yes. love I always love it because you're always like, I, I watch you. We talk on camera before you come on and you're doing yeah. shots like every time. Well like. <laughs> You've got whiskey shots lined up. The listeners can't tell because you hold your liquor so well, but I'm always thrilled to see oh. you come in so loose and ready to go. Do you know the funny thing is because <laughs> some of these listeners know me from Ocean to, uh, from uh, Marine Conservation Happy, Happy Hour? Hour? Yeah. Yeah, they're like, this guy can't hold his liquor Light not up. even a little bit. <laughs> no way. No, no thank you for whiskey shots. No yeah. way. Um, I was going to say I am excited because here in Canada – 
we actually for if you're 40 and above you can uh you can book your vaccine so did you, did i'm on a waiting it? list oh good i'm on my way i'm on a waiting list but we can go to the pharmacy at that and get a shot so i'm looking forward to getting my astrazeneca shot well, uh, so that'll be fun. oh you're getting the one you're getting the brain tumors that's great yeah, yeah i figure that, i figure out of all of them that would be the one to go with you yeah know, did you get to but, choose or uh, just whatever they have it's just it's usually just whatever it's what it the, actually, the AstraZeneca is the one that they're they're rolling out mm-hmm. uh, for us. Everybody else, like healthcare workers and teachers and stuff, are I think are Pfizer or Moderna. Yeah, it's my, like, uh, I got the J and J. Whatever's available. Uh, the Johnson Johnson. Oh, yeah? yeah, yeah. Over yeah. about six weeks ago, no blood clots yet. Doing really well. Uh, and, and, nice. and, he, and here in the U.S., uh, as of uh, this past Monday, anyone over sixteen can get one. So we are, yeah, which is crazy because here we're at like forty, and that was just released recently, which we're super excited because I yeah. think that'll bring a lot of the numbers down for well, us because our numbers are starting to pump up. Yeah, when, and I was thinking about this the other day, like you know, it's a year ago. The goal was to prevent hospitalization, not prevent the disease from being spread. And now we've right. moved into stopping the disease entirely, which is a different, a different goal, yes. right? Which is why a lot of people are you know, like forget the mask and all that. And I, and I right. so, but I think like once you get everyone over forty vaccinated who wants it, I think it can open up. I think it's you know you offer to, you I offer the so. vaccination to people. People they don't choose to take it. I, what are you going to do about them? You know, it's you well. That's it. I mean, I feel as though um, I mean it really depends on how how the, each government decides to go with mm-hmm. it, right? But you would think like what's in, what I was actually thinking about is the difference in population size between the U S and mm-hmm. Canada, mm-hmm. because the U S you have what th- over 300 million. Oh, so that, many people. Yeah. And they're all at yeah. Walmart right now. <laughs> Three. So you have 300 million. Mm-hmm. We have 36 million. Good nothing. So like, so 20% of your population that's, that's vaccinated is more than what our population is total. We are at 50. And you guys aren't even close. We were at 50% our country. Are you? I thought you were at like twenty percent. Mm. One half of all adults right now are vaccinated in the United States. Really? Yep. Oh, that's pretty good. That's still not. That's but that still leaves one hundred and fifty million mm-hmm. not vaccinated, which right. is still a lot. Well, and you got it. Then, but then you got to eliminate the kids sixteen or under can't get it, right? Yeah, true. And so true. that leaves a lot of people sixteen to about forty who now are like lining up to get it done. So. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. In New okay. Hampshire, yeah, where I live, we just we just uh, got rid of the mask mandates this week, which I'm not entirely happy about because this week is also when the vaccinations opened up to everybody else. So I thought the governor would say, six weeks from today, no more masks, right. and that way anyone who wants a vaccine can get one and yeah. get their, their you know to me that that data that makes sense. But to just say that makes oh. sense. But instead, he goes today, anyone time. who wants a vaccine can get one and no masks, and you're like. Mm. Mm. A little counterintuitive, little, little jump in the gun. I feel a jump bit. in the gun, yeah. But you know, we are the, New Hampshire up. By the way, is the number one vaccination place in the country right now. We have more vaccinated people per capita than anyone. So there you go. I, I don't well, care. I'll anymore. be honest. I'm excited. Like honestly, I'm excited to get it. I'm excited to sort of get back to a little bit of a, a new normal, mm-hmm. if, if 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 you will, and and uh, hopefully it'll get a better summer going for us. So, yeah. Well, so I, I'm, I'm uh, opening up a new kissing booth business this summer. So I'm excited <laughs> about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, number one vaccinated state, you might as well. Might right? as well. That's, yeah, that's I'm just a, the way to go. I'm looking doorknobs on the way out. So, <laughs> well, aren't you like the pageant king? I am, Mister Mister Mount Washington Valley. Yeah, Mister Mount Washington yeah. Valley. There you go. And the kissing booth. I, I think that's going to be a hot commodity. I, I mean, I guarantee I'm, it. When you're as pretty as I am, Andrew, it's a battle. <laughs> You want to do some news? <laughs> speaking of speaking of taking some shots before the before, <laughs> before the recording, you yes, were late. I was drinking. I was, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah. I was late. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's start with your story. We each have a story. Uh, you've done a little bit of extra research. You've definitely outperformed me as as usual. So uh, oh, don't count those chickens yet, Andrew. You haven't even heard the stories. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, this is this is out of Maine, and this came out in March, and I was going to do it on the Fish in the News for the Fish Nerds and never got around to it. Uh, so you get All to right. hear it here, and I felt Love I had to dive a little deeper. And this is a, in Maine. And this is really important uh, ocean legislation happening here. Uh, Mainers may soon be able to leave, life, leave this life in a blaze of glory as a new measure would allow a Viking-style funeral uh, at sea. So this is a, this, So if this new bill passes... <laughs> Maine would join Colorado as the only other state to allow the funeral ritual that's associated with the Norse culture. So, I, I, so do you know what the ritual is? 
Well, isn't it you, if, a, if, if a person dies, mm-hmm. you put them on a, on a, like a, a raft, like yeah. a, a wooden raft and there's like, they're lay, lay on like a bed of hay and mm-hmm. then they're kind of pushed off into the sea and then people fire bow and arrows and the arrows have fire on them to light them up on fire. You got it. It's Basically the Viking, creating. the Viking funeral pyre, uh, which is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> the practice itself was a huge part of the Norse culture of funeral rites, and it was adopted because Vikings believed that smoke would help carry the deceased into the afterlife as part of the ritual, and the bodies prepared and placed upon an open pyre and then cremated. Right. Um, my my bet, by the way, is no one ever got cremated on those things. My bet is they the wood burned and the body sank because it takes so much heat uh, to <laughs> to actually cremate a body. So I, I found that interesting. I also found it interesting that Colorado allows this ritual. Which but, I, I found, like, where are they like doing Like in this? the lakes? Well, I didn't dig on that side of it, but I just, just want to write to you, Colorado is the only other state that allows this ritual. So so was it, so this bill, um, is this was this like somebody wanted it? Because usually these bills just don't come out of the blue. Like usually yeah. it's, it's- Well, it's a propo- it's proposal by- number is LD1074. It's a nonprofit piece of legislation. And it allows nonprofits to conduct cremation by pyre as long as the organization owns at least 20 acres. So it doesn't mean at sea necessarily. It just means they can burn them as long as they get enough space. It would also restrict organizations from conducting more than one ceremony at a time. So you can't burn a pile of bodies, uh, but it will allow the cremated remains to be scattered on the property uh, or in any appropriate legal manner. Uh, but I was I was curious about the environmental impacts on a funeral pyre at sea. Like what happens when you send a pyre out in the ocean, light a body on the fire and all that debris sinks to the bottom. But it turns out I I couldn't find actual data on individual bodies, you know, because the impact is from one on a giant ocean is so low. Um, But the United States government does issue guidelines for instructions at burial at sea. So I thought we might talk about, the instructions on how to bury a body at sea. And this is legal in the United States. Right. So this is like, especially like for the Navy, if they, if they, like they send somebody Mm -hmm. out to sea, you know, after they pass away or something at sea, then, okay. Right. And this is legal, by the way, even if you're not in the military, this is the law of the United States. So main law of the pirate doesn't match these laws. And we'll talk about that as we get into it. If you're, if you're okay with are they more federal laws? This is a federal laws? law, right. Okay. So, but Maine's pyre law is about the state of Maine, right? So, right. so right. it's a different. Okay. Right. So I'm going to kind of run down. We're going to kind of breeze through these instructions on how to bury someone at sea because you've always Let's wanted to know. This is, this is the news you need here for Ocean <laughs> Talk. <laughs> All right. So human remains shall be prepared. For burial at sea, I'm not going to read, read all of it to you, but I'm going to give you some details. Yeah, yeah. Shall be prepared for burial at sea uh, in accordance with regular practices and requirements that are, are appropriate, right? Which means they're regular old, ready-to-go bodies. You can't, you can't preserve them. Right, right. right. Um, they, they allow non-cremated and cremated remains to do it. So you can, you can do whole bodies or you can do just ashes. So let's talk about non-cremated remains. And, and by the way, bef- before you do any of this, you have to be at least two miles out to sea. You can't that makes like, sense. You don't you, want the body to come back, right? You can't. So, so floating a pyre on the beach in the coast of Maine and lighting your dad on fire, <laughs> too close to shore, <laughs> it's not going to go yeah. anywhere. So you got to. You don't want to do that. You may see him earlier than you expect. You got to drag him out, right? So, so if using a castic, plastic materials need to be removed. So you can't have any plastics in there, right? Because you don't want to. Do it. Gotcha. Everything has to be biodegradable. Yep. Um, and you don't want to create any marine debris. So a metal casket is what the U.S. Navy use. And the EPA recommends that only uh, a minimum of two two-inch holes be drilled throughout. So you got to drill a whole bunch of holes in the casket. They're so going to be sinks. two inches around, right? Okay. If, let me translate that to Canadian. has to be four and a half centimeters. Four and a half centimeters. There you go. <laughs> All right. That's my... That's best I can do for you there. Um, but they recommend at least eight holes in the bottom, eight holes in the top, and eight on each side. So okay. they've, they've done the math on this. Uh, to aid yeah. in sink, sinking, they recommend that you fill it with sand, cement, or rocks. Um, they do not recommend lead. Lead is illegal. Lead's bad for the environment. Yeah. So they are, they're conscious of that, right? So there you go. Uh, I can't believe there's a lot of thought goes into these burials at sea. Um, the casket should be banded 
with six durable stainless steel bands or chains or fiber rope. So you have to like wrap the chest up in rope, wow. steel bands, or chains. And that way the Especially zombie- the casket doesn't open. Yeah, the zombie comes right out otherwise. You don't want those zombies floating to the top of the water. Well, let's be honest. That's so the body doesn't get eaten. Right, that's really what it's coming. No, because all of these things have to be biodegradable, and the idea is that we get to the bottom in the casket, and that will all rot away, and then get eaten down there. At the bottom, right? The but crabs I mean, the, get the, them, but the body would have been would have sort of rotted away by that by the time the casket goes right, like a right. metal casket. Right. Well, the recommendation is natural fiber ropes in order to ensure rapid and permanent sinking of the intact t- casket. So. I don't know what the rope, but so I don't know what that, that sentence makes sense now I read it out loud. Um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they need to get to the bottom <laughs> fast and they need to be biodegradable. Uh, okay. The, the trick is get it down there fast. Um, so for non cremated remains, here's your location and measures. Um, the permit authorized burial at sea for non cremated human remains, at least three nautical miles from land, and the water has to be at least 600 feet deep. So it can't be in some shallow spot. That's important. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Right. In certain and areas, that would almost clear up the two miles away from shore too, because yeah, usually you got to be pretty far out to get six hundred. Yeah, and I was wrong with three hundred meters or hundred or six hundred feet. Six hundred feet. Okay. Which I don't know okay. meters on that. I'd, I'd be like two hundred. Yeah, six hundred feet is not crazy. We fish that depth. Yeah, it's not like a huge. It's not, but it's enough so it doesn't try and come back up. Right. Yeah. The pressure down there. There, if he's alive still, he's not coming back. Um, no. No. In certain areas, like in Florida. Uh, near Pensacola and the Mississippi River Delta, such sea burials are only authorized if it's 1,800 feet deep. So mm. deep, deeper in those areas must be more zombies. If it's cremated, they don't. There's not. There's not a lot of rules for cremated remains. Just dump them in the ocean. No one cares. But if, I wonder. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. But I wonder if, like, for the depth, I wonder if it's modeled so that it there's really no way it can come back up because there might be like upwellings in certain areas. I'm, I'm sure of it. They're very specific on those locations yeah, and where they, they sound, can do it. Yeah. Um, if you're going to put a wreath or flowers in there, you can't have plastics in them. They have to be biodegradable, completely stuff. So, right. so you can't take plastic flowers from the your local Walmart and tape them to the top, the top of the casket and drop them down there. Gotcha. Right. So that's they're thinking about all this. And then this is, this seems backwards to me. Um, once you bury someone at sea, you have 30 days to no- notify the EPA. Oh, that was like after the fact, or body back after the fact. <laughs> so, yeah, you must. After the, so how? Yeah, with you must notify the EPA mm-hmm. at sea within 30 days following the event. So after you mm-hmm. bury someone at sea, by the way, EPA, my dad died last week. I dropped him in the ocean. So, in other words, all that stuff you said before. Mm-hmm. That's just more of a guideline, uh huh. Because everybody else could just be like, "Oh yeah, I buried you, bury him properly." Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, mm-hmm. no problem. And yeah. unless that body comes back, they'll never know. They're gonna take you at your word <laughs> for it. So but I guess you know what though. But I guess if you're doing it, you want to do it in an honorable way. Mm-hmm. So you would think that you would follow these because I would imagine a lot of these regulations would be try and make it as honorable as possible, right? Right, and it doesn't supersede state law. So, like, if you if your dad dies, there's probably a law requiring you to tell the state that your dad died before you, of course, put him in a yeah, box. You got to tell that he passed away. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Drag him out to the ocean. There's some legal stuff you got to do there. So, right, um, right. Yeah, but uh, I mean, they have everything worked out. Like, there's, there's all these frequently asked questions, which I find amazing that there's frequently asked questions. Like, I didn't think it was popular enough to have FAQs. Well, how often do you know how often this happens? I, like, is this is this a regular occurrence or a fairly regular occurrence? It, in, it, only in New Jersey and only by the mafia. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, no, because I would thinking, but no, no, because I'm because I'm thinking like, say you have a former, a lot of military. So say you have a former like veteran right. who was in the Navy and then like, you know, passed away from natural causes when they were 80s or 90s. And mm-hmm. then maybe they want to be buried at sea. Oh, right. Um, I bet it's more common than you think. Right. Um, I'm trying. But they I'm, just didn't get like, maybe they didn't get like a full military burial or maybe after the military burial, they would go, they would go to sea and they would like put, you know, at, at their wishes, put them to sea. You know what I mean? Right. So, so looking at Wikipedia here real quick here, uh, it does indicate that it is actually a pretty rare thing. 
And currently, the only mm. time the Navy does bury out sea now is for really long-term uh, veterans of the, in the service. And so okay. it may be a World War II vet or maybe someone who's right. been a, a pretty extraordinary service. So it's not a very co- common thing these days. Gotcha. Um, That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. That and there, makes, and there is a lot sense. of religious reasons not to do it. You know, oh, really? Oh, sure. Lots of religion really requires that church burial, the proper graveyard. Oh, oh right. You know, think right. Catholicism and, and uh, Protestants. So it's a lot of... I'm not going to get into yeah. that. I just, I just now, just now on Wikipedia, when I was reading about how often it happens, there was all these religious reasons not to do it. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to not go there. Cause <laughs> <laughs> so now would you, here's a question for mm-hmm. you. Uh, when the time comes for you, mm-hmm. would you want to be buried at sea and, or would you want to be cremated and ashes spread at sea? If you had the choice. So I had, I, well, what you're giving me two, two ocean choices. Um, I you know I never thought about burial at sea until just now, and I kind of think I love the idea so much. Um, but my my original plan for for me when I die is to have a spring loaded casket, and so like during the viewing, I want it to just just spring and land on, on the top of the casket. Jesus. Um, what I the the way I handle death and dying is like my wife has all these plans she wants. When I die, she has this list of things to do, and I say I'm going to do all those things exactly the way you describe them. But what's really going to happen when she dies is I'm going to do whatever I want because she's dead and she <laughs> won't know the difference. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's so, that's so funerals funny. are not for the dead, they're for the living. So whatever, you know, people want. Yeah. That's true. Whatever people want to see. Did you ever see the video of the Irish guy who passed away and there's like an Irish funeral and um, people were around the, the bear. They, they were actually put, lowering him down in the graveyard and then he had an audio tape played had someone play the audio tape and it's him knocking from inside. Yes, I have seen that. And he's I like, love hello? It. Yes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I and it made it. everybody laugh because apparently that's what he was. He was just like a jokester kind of thing. I love and it. it. Kinda, I think it lightened up the mood and, and stuff. And I'm just like, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Cause now you're thinking of the other people. You're trying to cheer them up and show what, what you're kind of, you know, if you're about. funny in life, you should be funny in death too. So why not? I, I agree. I completely agree. I think for me, I, w- I don't know if I'd want to have my body buried at sea. I think ashes would be better because I wouldn't want to pollute. Like I feel the metal casket's not really that biodegradable. Well, think about and the um, the amount of energy it takes to cremate you. That's true. Like you're gonna if so if you're cremated, you are directly being converted into yeah, a greenhouse gas, fuels. right? So. I mean, immediately. Yeah, I don't know what's. I I wonder what the carbon footprint is of different burials. I bet you composting is the best way to go. Well, I bet the best way to go. That's a real thing that you can Google. Composting. The, there is there is composting humans in the United States anyway. The other thing you could do is just leave the bodies in the woods and let the animals eat them and not worry about it. Like that's yeah. probably the best way to do it. But true, uh, really scary. True. If but that's if you're just a not. Hiker. I don't think that's legal. Yeah, I'm not no, sure if that's only that's that's legal. Nor in I don't Vermont. think we're very good for. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel yeah, it was a hunting accident. No, anyway, we're getting in trouble for this one. Yeah. But um, that's my news. <laughs> I love you. I love the news. <laughs> you know, but it's interesting though too because um, there was a, a researcher friend of mine, uh, Dr. Craig McLean, who's been on this podcast before. Name He's God. the executive director at, at Lumcon. He's mm-hmm. a great guy. He did a study called and he called it log fall. And what he did is he would take a log. And, and this is what happens on a regular basis. When trees fall and, they get, and they're along the coastline, they end up going down a river, they go into the ocean, they fall into the depths. And so he wanted to see what would happen to these logs as they fell. It was really great because he did this whole like crowdfunding experiment to, uh, to fund it and stuff. It was, it was on experiment.com. It was, it was really well done. Anyway, he took pictures, like deep sea pictures. Like he, so he, laid it, he let it sink to the deep sea and they had cameras around it and everything. And they actually saw these like giant isopods would like come around it and eat all the wood up. Awesome. And, uh, and it was cool. Then he did an alligator and he had an alligator that was dead. And he let it fall down. And again, giant isopods were all over the alligator and they ate it all up, which is really, it's just a really interesting kind of study of like what would happen if you drop these large predators or they die and they go down, it gets all gets eaten up. 
you know, and, and it gets, it goes back into the system, let's just say. Um, so it was really kind of cool. Anyway, well, uh, things are always going to eat you. It doesn't matter where you're at, you know, it doesn't matter where you're yep. at. If you're in a casket, if you're, if something's going to, something's going to get you. Well, Cause you're made Even of meat down to the micro. Yeah, exactly. You're made of meat. Exactly. Yeah. You're made of meat. A lot of carnivores out there. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to go with a story uh, out of Manga Bay News. Our, our good friends over at Manga Bay. Oh, uh, did you sponsor. did you see Eric's exhibit in Vermont? He did an art exhibit. I went and I visited. It was uh, at um, in Brattleboro, Vermont. I drove out to take a look at. It. He did a whole exhibit of ice hole pictures. And oh, cool. at, at an art exhibit, and I drove out and took a look at it, and it was so cool. And so, That's so awesome. Eric, Eric Hoffner. It, yep. Is 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 one of the editors uh, at uh, at Manga Bay? Great guy. He's been in touch with both you and I, you know, to to supply us with stories and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Manga Bay is not a, not a sponsor of the show. They are just great at news. I love their stories. Ocean, terrestrial, forest doesn't matter. I think they're they're absolutely amazing. And they got a podcast. And they do have a podcast. They yes, they do. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, it's the Manga Bay podcast, I believe, Easy. and it's actually it's rated pretty well. Yeah. So. That's, that's I can tell cool. you don't listen to it. I do. I do listen to it. I just <laughs> it's a listen. good one. I listen. like that a lot. <laughs> okay, listen. I edit. I edit so many podcasts. I was telling this to a friend of mine. I don't get to listen to podcasts mm-hmm. anymore, and so it's very difficult for me to listen to the podcast that I normally would listen mm-hmm. to. But Manga Bay was on my list. Thank you very much for <laughs> trying to call me out. All right. All right. Uh, this uh, story is kind of interesting because it's it's actually has an update today, Ooh. which is April twenty first. So uh, this is all about. I'm not sure if you've heard of this, but the Maldives uh, were in the news because they had a ninety thousand square kilometer sanctuary, a marine sanctuary that banned shark fishing and finning. Uh, but recently, the minister Zaha Wahid. Uh, said that he would that the government may be planning on lifting the ban of fishing in that area, and that had a ripple around the world. Conservationists, people, divers, people who visited the Maldives uh, were extremely worried because sharks are around the Maldives all the time. It's a huge tourist attraction, and ecotourism is one of their major revenue uh, streams that that come out there, and not fisheries. And so. Um, there was there was back and forth of unofficial reports that this wasn't going to happen, then it was going to happen, then they were going to open up a long line fishery for tuna. Um, and so that was like for big eye tuna. And that was a bit of a possibility. And so they were worried about shark bycatch. And of course, as you know, uh, Clay, shark bycatch, uh, shark fishing, shark finning are pretty much the major reasons why shark populations are declining worldwide by 90% overall. So a lot of people were worried. Yeah, D- Damian Chapman, a marine scientist at, uh, I believe it's Florida International University, uh, he leads Global Finprint, a project that assesses shark populations and reefs around the world. He was worried because he said this is a spot where they're often found. The Maldives is a tiny nation of islands speckled in the, in the Indian Ocean. And in the Indian Ocean, shark populations have been really decimated. And so like a lot of places along the coastlines, um, have really lo- seen a lot of uh, decrease in sharks, especially for the, and, and it's not been good for the scuba diving industry uh, along those areas. So um, it's been a, a real, a real worry. The good news is though, there's an update today in the Ministry of Fisheries, Marine Resources and Agriculture released a statement that's saying uh, it does not intend to open the targeted uh, shark fishery. It also clarified that Minister Zaha Wahid's comments were part of an internal discussion about reinstating a long line fishery for big eye tuna and potential shark bycatch for that fishery. So it sounds like they're not going to open the shark fishery and it sounds like somebody screwed up and let something leak. I don't know if it was the minister himself or one of his aides that said that they were thinking of opening this up. And I don't know if they just tried to do that uh, to see if how people would react, but apparently it got not only national, but international outcry. And that was uh, a lot of the reason why they went back on whether they were going to open it or not. But right. a lot of people in this, in this uh, article from the Mana Trust uh, to local and NGOs that were there that uh, essentially were speaking out against it. Um, and it looks like everything is going to be just fine, and we're still going to see sharks in the Maldives in the future. Well, that's really good news. Now, it's interesting. I always think about these, these, these leaks that happen when someone says something in a meeting and that gets out. How many meetings have you been in where you're just spitballing ideas 
And yeah. And that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to brainstorm. You're supposed to put out good ideas and bad ideas as part of that brainstorming process. Is it possible that genuinely he was just tossing ideas around with his, you know, coworkers and this one got taken out and blew up on him, uh, you know, and I don't think it's negative necessarily it blew up on him because it really showed how the whole world's like, (gasps) don't, don't mess with those sharks. But at the same time, Oh yeah. At the same time, I, I really don't like when people are, when people feel afraid to share ideas, even when they're bad ideas, you know, we don't want to squash well, anyone's, you know, sharing yeah. of even, even a bad idea is worth sharing and talking about. It's, you know, it's, Oh, for sure. I yeah. mean, I've been part of, I've been part of uh board of directors of nonprofits where every, every AGM, every annual, annual general meeting, somebody's like, like usually the, the president is just like, so should we continue on with this organization? That is a possibility that mm-hmm. we could end it. And of course it's always no, but if he says that or he or she says that, and all of a sudden it gets out and people are like, well, hold on mm-hmm. a second. You know, we have projects with you. Like it becomes a, a big thing. Now, you know, opening up a fishery is not necessarily um, something that's never talked about as we, as we saw in this case, it's always probably talked about every year. You could be right. It could be one of those things that got leaked. Maybe sometimes it's a game that, that officials play where they leak it on purpose. See how people react. Well, if everyone reacts like, Oh good, we're going to do it. Then they go, wow, let's do it then. You know? Yeah. Like like apparently in the article, it says that they had like the, the vote, like the, a lot of the voters wanted the fishery. So it sounds like maybe some local people wanted the fishery mm. and the article doesn't necessarily go too much into sort of what the situation is for other people who are not part of the tourism industry. But a lot of times in island, small islands like this, even in the Caribbean, even in, in Southeast Asia, a lot of these islands are more, you know, they depend on eco, they depend on tourism in general. That's their big revenue stream. And you can't mess with the big revenue stream. So what, uh, what the article further goes on and saying is that sometimes it, it takes years to establish a fishery mm-hmm. where it could also take, very few years to destroy a fishery if you're not doing it properly. Well, especially if, you're, so you if your if your fishery is the large, the biggest apex predators, those are also the slowest reproducers. So, it, right, you know, shark tastes delicious, but is it that delicious <laughs> where you want to wipe them all out? You know. Well, it's also it's yeah, you're right, and it's also like it's very difficult to manage a sustainable shark fishery. Only mm-hmm. a few nations have done it. Uh, it's mentioned that's mentioned also in the article. And plus, when you take away an apex predator, you change the system. So, are you prepared to deal with those kind of consequences when it seems like the shark populations are doing fine? It seems like everything is everything is fine in there. Now, I don't know the true economics of the Maldives. You know whether another industry like fishing and something extractive is necessary. Uh, is possible um, or, you know, is just wanted by the people. You know what would be a good industry for them? I'm going to give, I'm going to spitball some industry ideas for the Maldives. I think they should offer shark burials at sea. Just (laughs) hear me out, (laughs) Andrew. Bring it in together. Hear me out on this. So imagine, you know, your dad dies, you know, and, you know, he wasn't a Navy hero, so you don't feel good (laughs) about, well, was your dad a Navy hero? No. So, no okay, so I'm right. All right, so be on my team here. All right, so your dad's not a hero, just a regular dad, drinks beer too much, all the things. But you want to bury him at sea because he deserves a shark burial, right? And it's his last will. When I die, I want to get eaten by sharks. And you're like, well, the Maldives is doing that. So then you, you right. spend all the money to ship your dad, your dead dad, <laughs> to the Maldives. Your whole family gets to go out, right? You're out on a shark boat, right? You get in, and they, they lower all these shark cages down in the water. They chum the water, right? And then everyone's in the water. You're all I've got your scuba gear on. You're all crying. you got nice music playing in your ear holes. And then the sharks come in because of all the chum. It's awful. And they lower awful. your dad down, and you get to... No. No. Awful. You're not hearing awful. me out. You're not a very good brainstormer. That's awful. What if this gets That's out, awful. Andrew? <laughs> you know, it's going to get out because we just recorded. <laughs> of course it's going to get out. I think I'm on to something. Idea. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> and as a bonus, the sharks get fed. Everyone wins. We're yeah, made of meat, not Andrew. Right. We're, not, we're not good for them. Oh, we're but, not good for oh, them. We but you know what would happen, Andrew, is the sharks get a taste for humans. <laughs> and then it's game over. <laughs> I hope... I hope the listeners catch your sarcasm. I, I God, I hope mine will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're weird. <laughs> Sharks aren't vegans, Andrew. Uh, That's the truth. 
No, they're definitely not. They're no. definitely not. But you know, I I think it's um I think it's really interesting when you when we talk about lifting a ban mm-hmm. on sh- on like fishing in general. You know, whether it be a shark sanctuary fishing or like I mean, th- if you think about just the fishery in general, there's so many other populations of species that will be affected by this, uh, whether it's a tuna fishery or whether it's the shark, shark fishery or, or what have you. There is a legal fishery already going on. They've been caught. They've been, it's been enforced, you know, so we already know, but imagine if a fishery opens up illegal, more illegal fishing will come in uh, to play. And, and we probably won't see many sharks in the Maldives in probably a decade or so, or maybe even under that. So I think it's, it's, and of course a change in what an apex predator would do to the system. So I'm glad that they're not, Me that too. they're not, banning i'm glad that they're not feeding people to sharks I, i'm not uh, you know i think it's a good <laughs> you're idea you're not apparently no. now you <laughs> let me d- i thought you'd be on my team on this now there is now there is I, I don't know if it still happens but um there is a thing called reef balls where you could put your ashes sounds like a, a disease and be part of a reef i know it does I'm, i met so, a girl in the maldives i got reef balls <laughs> 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 I didn't get my reef, reef balls ball back used, <laughs> Reef reef balls are used to line uh you know, to line like you know people Bring for, for years reef. for years pirates were known for their reef balls like they would go out to sea for months and come back <laughs> suffering from reef balls Oh my god That's why Blackbeard awesome. walks um, so funny <laughs> reef balls. It's not elephant titus for god's sakes um anyway so but it's like reef balls you can put your ashes in these concrete sort of pillars mm-hmm. they act as like a, a reef or it's a restoration process uh but you could do that but um but yeah don't get don't don't throw people in no i i i think That's you can do both idea. i think you can feed sharks and have reef balls so <laughs> i i, I I think so. Yeah, just split the body. Maybe we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. I think. I'm not I sure think it's a great countries idea. Countries would get into that. Well, yeah. Well, as long as yeah, they're okay. dead well, first. I don't, I don't. I think we're going to agree to disagree. <laughs> That's not agreeing. <laughs> I'm so let down by you. I, you know, I think Manga <laughs> Bay would be on my team. I wouldn't put that in. I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'd say Eric would be like the the, no, t- the this episode title minute. is Manga Bay supports feeding dead people oh, to sharks. God. That's that's the headline. Oh, we'll see if this even gets published. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, people, even even oh, environmentalists yeah. need to laugh. That's true. That's yeah. true. We are being sarcastic here. This is all for a joke, but uh, you know, it's 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 <laughs> it's always fun. It's always fun uh, to talk news with you, Clay. I I do appreciate uh, you coming on and. Everybody loves the fish in the news. And last on the last episode of the Fish Nerds podcast, I mentioned that I am shopping around for a new co-host. I want to get a regular weekly co-host so I'm not every week trying to cobble a show together. I do the show kind of on my own. We do have a lot of correspondence, but the heavy lifting is on me. It's my show. Um, and we love the correspondence, but I want to get a regular co-host. Now, Doc Martin and I were talking. She says, Clay, I want to be your co-host, but our schedules don't jive. So I can't use Doc Martin the way I would love to have her every week on the show. So I put it out in the world and said, hey, if you want to co-host, email me, clay at fishnerds.com, and you can help me co-host the show, and I'm going to try some people out. So on next week's show, we're trying out a new person for the co-host seat. I'm going to try and use him for two or three weeks. And if other people want to try out, I will try them out as well. And then we will pick a co-host for the show. I may pick more than one. I may be a rotating co-host. I don't know. I'm pretty open-minded. This show is very, very fluid, always changing, always growing, which is why I think the Fish Nerds is still so fun and been around for so long. The other thing I want to remind you, the Fish Nerds is almost 300 episodes old, which for a podcast is really old. Most podcasts don't release more than seven episodes, and we've got almost 300, and we're not a huge show. We don't have we don't have tens of thousands of people listening. We've got thousands of people listening, and we appreciate every single one of you. So you can help the show by uh, sharing it with your friends. Tell, tell your friend about the Fish Nerds and let them know that we're out here, and a lot of other podcast fishing shows have come out. A lot of them sound very much like the show we've put together for you. We've been doing it. We're the OG fishing podcast now. Been in it probably longer than most other shows. 
So tell your friends about us and help us grow that way. And if you want to give us a call and be on our 300th episode, call 607-378-FISH. Leave us a voicemail, 607-378-FISH, and I'll use it on the 300th episode. And I'm planning something big, but I don't know what it is yet. So if you have ideas on what we can do for that last episode, I'd appreciate that too. And that's it. The show's over. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Big, fat, super big thank you to Dr. Barbarossa and Doc Martin for talking climate change with us. Big thanks to Andrew Lewin from Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. Thanks to Zoe and the brook trout we killed. We appreciate you too. Thanks to Wally Pleasant for our theme music. Thank you to Diane's Bath Salts for the news theme. And thank you to Boat Setter, BoatSetter.com for the sponsorship of this episode this month. They're sponsoring us all month long. And we couldn't be happier about this partnership. Uh, I believe in the product. I've, I've worked with these people before. Uh, and so I, I hope that you give them a shot if you're on vacation and you want to book a boat, BoatSetter.com. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd spawn early and often. Never trust a fluence with strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get. That's it. Don't Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Just for the hell of it. Fried in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast.